Okay, all right, let's get started. So this is, we'll try this for a few weeks, I'll see how it goes. Uh, it's not, uh, I know it's not terribly comfortable, but it's a lot more uncomfortable for me, actually, than for you. <laughs> let's talk to his uh, ear. So we'll try to do the best we can. So the course, you know, at least until uh, January 28th, right, will be this sort of hybrid thing. So you can attend either on Zoom or in person. Although counting the number of people here and the uh, number of people on Zoom, we're getting about half the students in class. So I would prefer if people you know, show up one way or the other, right? So for people listening to the recording, I prefer you show up to class and not just uh, listen to the recording afterwards, okay? So again, there's no preferred method for the class. Uh, show up however you can. Uh, also, you know, for quarantine isolation, I know a lot of instructors are getting emails about what to do. We have no role in that. Right? Go check the EHNS health guidelines. We'll follow whatever that guideline is and changes you know, weekly, if not daily. So whatever that thing says, we'll follow that. Right? If you have any specific arrangement for this class, uh, you know, talk to me, but uh, otherwise uh, follow the university guidelines on that, okay? Any questions for the format? Okay, so if you have questions, especially for the people doing this remotely, please speak up. Okay, I won't see the chat. So for the people doing remotely, I won't see the chat in real time. So if you have questions, please uh, ask and speak up. All right, so otherwise we'll do the best we can. Okay, so we'll continue from last time. Right? Continue from last time, we talk about uh, generating power through airfoil. So basically last time we covered, we have, we have airfoil, we have moving air coming this way. What happens, it will generate a lift right? and the list lift turns into torque. And then torque because we're spinning, torque turns into power. Okay, so we're still not at the stage yet of talking about how this power becomes electric power. So this is still mechanic power extracted by the blade, not a electric power yet. But uh, for this class, we're still gonna talk about how do you extract this power? And how do you get this power out here? And not talk about the electric power until we get to generators and motors. So the main way to control how much torque you get or how much power you get is to you know, change the angle of attack. Right, so torque. Right, so depend on this uh, variable called alpha. Okay. So in real time, what you could control is the relative position of the wind blade versus the wind that's coming in. And this is the angle alpha. So by changing this angle alpha, you can change how much power you extract. You can either try to you know, maximize the power or keep a constant power. Okay. So th this is the really sort of the main control you have for a wind turbine in real time is the angle of attack, this alpha number. But the tricky thing about this is this alpha is referenced to the wind direction, okay? So when we talk about the angle of attack, really the frame of reference, the correct frame of reference is a reference to whichever wind the wind is blowing. So not to grab, okay? So this is slightly different. If you think about an airplane flying, you will think the angle of attack is to grab. How much are you lifting? But for wind turbine is whichever wind, way wind is blowing. Okay, so wind doesn't have to blow parallel to ground. Wind almost never blows parallel to ground. So your angle of attack is measured from the true wind direction. Right? And that's where, cre so we'll see how that works. But one challenge was talking about angle of attack as you have to reference wind direction or to reference where the wind is coming. That's actually not a very easy thing to measure if you're a wind turbine, okay? So measuring wind speed is relatively easy. 
merging the vector in one direction is more challenging. So you really don't know. You need a vector, right? right? So this wouldn't come in. This is a vector, that's the direction. The magnitude, which is theta, is relatively easier to measure. The direction is hard. Okay. So we'll see sort of how do I account for this direction? And then we'll see there's another number we use. That's not the angle of attack, but it's an easier frame of reference from the turbine perspective. Okay. Right. Any questions about this? Okay, all right. So, right, so the thing to remember is there is a, we call something called the true width, right? So the true one is, basically you want to, at the end of the day, you want to measure the relative speed between wind and turbine, not the speed of the wood seen from a ground point of view. That's not a very useful measurement to have. So you really want to sort of the, what the wind is seen from a moving turbine. So basically, now we're gonna do some vector addition. Okay, we're gonna do some vector addition, right? So if you look at vector addition, so this is saying that if you have wind, if you have wind blowing in one direction, you have wind blowing in one direction, and then you have some moving mass, then you have a bigger apparent speed. Right? So if you look at this is your airfoil, okay? if this is your airfoil, and then your airfoil is moving against wind. Okay, so if wind is coming this way and you're moving towards wind. Then from your perspective, you have a stronger wind, right? There's a bigger speed. Okay, you're moving towards wind. So it's, it's equivalent to if wind is sort of you know, blowing harder on the airfoil. Okay, so you have to think when we talk about speed, we have a moving object in wind. Then it's a vector addition or vector subtraction of the two speed that matters. So you want to know the relative speed of the two. Okay. All right, so, and the, the tricky thing here is if wind is moving one way, and if you're going against the wind, this is, is as if wind is faster. Right, so if you're moving against the wind, it appears as if you have a, no, wind has a bigger magnitude, you have a bigger wind coming in, okay? So, as in, so here, because, you know, when W and V are in opposite directions, it appears if things are larger, that's a little bit inconvenient, right? It's a little bit inconvenient. We want to add vectors. Our intuition is, you know, when things are bigger, we should be adding them. So the idea is you define something called H, which is minus V, right? so H is minus V. So we can talk about the relative wind speed as W minus V. These are all vectors. This is rather inconvenient because of this minus sign, right? Our idea is you no, know, things should get bigger. When we, when we add them, nothing should get bigger when we subtract them. So we can define H, as minus V, then the relative speed will be the wind speed plus H, okay? H is just for the negative of how fast you're moving relative to wind, right? So if you're moving towards the wind, the H will be a large, it be a positive number. So when you add them, you get a larger wind speed. Right. So this is just, so in wind, in aerodynamics and in turbine, uh, in wind energy, you a lot of times see a speed called H, right? So sometimes H is a little bit weird. It's just uh, you have a sign reversal compared to V. Okay. Any questions about this? All right, so this is if they're head on. If they're not head on, that's okay. Right? We can still do vector additions. So for example, you can have a Let's say this is your wind speed. Okay. This is a wind coming in. Let's say your turbine is moving this way. This is your H. Right. Then once we add, we get this 
the relative speed is w plus h. So we're doing vector additions. Right? We're going to do vector additions instead of uh, simple scalar additions. Right? So there's a relative. All of these things have both a magnitude and angle. Right? And uh, this, and for example, you can have you know all kind of different situations. You can have say wind pointing perpendicularly downwards. You can have a turbine moving horizontally. Then this is your true relative speed. And this is your turbine. Okay, so at the end of the day, we care about the relative, the relative wind speed, the relative direction. And everything is measured relative to this. And questions? All right, so for turbines, the nice thing is we always have a, right? So because this is not airplane. So if you look at airplane wind, there's actually a lot of degrees freedom having to do with airplane. You can pitch, you can roll, you can go up and down. Turbines are more constrained, right? So the reason that turbines are more constrained is they're fixed onto a hub and they can only rotate one way. So it's a very constrained motion of what turbines can do. So when we talk about you know, the motion of the turbine, they have not that many degrees of freedom. They can only rotate and they typically rotate only one way. Okay, so the turbine rotation, the turbine won't be moving in a circle. So there is some velocity that depends on the speed of the rotation and how large the turbine is. And if you look at it from a side, well, you just see airfoil that's just moving up. Okay, so the airfoil is just moving up. So when we talk about relative speed, normally for an airplane airfoil, H can be anything. There's a lot of freedom in what H is. When we talk about wind turbine, the velocity of wind turbine or the vector of the sort of the direction of movement for wind turbine is very constrained. It's constrained to this horizontal vertical line up and down. Okay, that's the only way it can move. This is, you cannot, you're very constrained to this motion. You cannot go this way, you cannot go this way, you can only go up and down. Okay, so it's a very constrained motion. Okay, so when we compute this, then the, we can always pick a fixed direction for H. Okay, we can take a fixed direction for H because we know the velocity. So if you look at a turbine, the velocity is always going up. That's the only way it can go. And then the H is always going down. H is always going downwards. So if the relative wind speed is basically will come down to something, you know, a vector that's uh, pointing downwards. So this is what the relative speed will come, will come out to be. And then the angle of attack, the angle of attack is defined between the relative, this angle, between the relative uh, velocity of the wind and the center line of the turbo. So that's our alpha angle. Okay, so you have a center line as the turbine, you have a center line across the blade. You have some relative wind speed coming in, and this is your angle of attack. So that's that's how the alpha angle is defined. Right? You have an angle that's uh, between the center line and the relative and the WR, this relative wind velocity. Okay, and by varying alpha, we can change the amount of power we have. So there. So to compute this WR, because you know the direction of V, so we can measure W. This is with respect to ground, then compute WR. Right? The way we can do this is because we know exactly how the turbines will be moved. So there's a defined motion for the turbines, and then there's, we, 
if we can measure, we know how the turbine moves with respect to ground. If we can measure the wind speed with respect to ground, we can do a vector addition to figure out what the angle of attack is. Okay. Any questions about this? Okay. So end of the day, just to remember the direction of wind matters. So if you measure some place at wind speed, let's say 10 meters per second, that doesn't necessarily translate to a 10 meter per second on the blade. It will depend on which direction this is going and the relative direction on that. Okay, so that matters. Any questions? Okay, so we'll do an example with this, but before that, it's useful to think about. It's useful to think about is there an easier frame of reference we can have? Right, so this frame of reference is not terribly easy to use. You have to measure the wind uh, direction at ground, that would do a you know, vector addition. It may not be easy to measure the wind direction at ground. Okay. Is there an easier frame of reference to use? Is there an easier thing to use? If you look at this picture, right? So we have an absolute trick that's correct. But well, we said that's not useful. There are too, too many moving things. We have a reference frame that could work, which is the one direction, the sort of relative one direction, but that changes time to time. So what is the another easier frame of reference to use? Okay. Right, so the, so the easiest turns out is to, we should use this V as a frame. This is the, easiest frame of reference to use. And this is actually what we use as a frame of reference. That's because the ground is not useful. But then the only, the other thing that's fixed other than ground is the motion of the turbine. So if we end up using that in. Okay, so we'll do a calculation with this sort of angle of attack and alpha. Then we'll look at sort of the more practical angle to use. Okay. Any questions? All right, so sorry for the folks on Zoom. So this is, uh, turn, my, uh, turn on my camera, but uh, the only thing you can see is this wall behind me. I'm not sure is there a way to uh, capture the screen. I'm not sure of that. <clears throat> but hopefully turning on my camera will help a little bit for folks. So for the remote folks, does this work? All right. So some people say it's working fine. Okay, so we'll continue doing this way then. Okay. So let's keep, right? So let's do an example question. This is sort of the flavor of things we have if we can you know, happen to measure the wind direction as well as speed. So suppose we're able to measure the wind speed at 15 meters per second at angle 20 degrees respect to the horizontal plane. Okay, so this means that if you have a horizontal plane, this is basically ground. Horizontal plane means we have ground. You have a wind that's coming in. So the length is 15 meters per second. This angle is 20 degrees. Okay. So we're able to make this measure. Right? We somehow measure the direction as well. And then we have a blade that's uh, 20 meters long measuring through the center of gravity and rotating at uh, 20 RPF, rotations per minute. So we want to compute the relative wind speed and the direction. Okay, we want to compute now the relative speed. Okay, so let's try to do this computation. Right? Let's try to do this calculation, okay? So let's say this is our ground, this is our or the frame of reference for now. Then we have a wind vector. So this is our true wind, right? This is the wind relative to ground. Now, what is our blade, right? So how is our blade moving? How is our blade moving? Well, from before, our blade only moves up and down. 
Okay, so the important thing to remember is in this question, it only tells you the rotation speed of the blade. It doesn't say anything about the angle of the blade or the direction of the blade. So the thing to remember is because this is a wind turbine, the blade can only go in this vertical direction. There's only one way this can, can go. All right, so then because what we care about this W plus H, so this is our V, this is our H. So H is equal to minus V. So let's just think of the blade moving up in a vertical line. That creates H. And then our true wind direction is this thing. This is W plus H. So this is from the relative, from the true wind speed and direction, we can compute the relative wind speed and direction. We can compute this. Right, any questions about this formula? So you will see a question like this, for example, on the metric. Right? So it's important to at least know how to do this question. And again, the most common mistake for people on the meter is forgetting V and H. Okay, a lot of times people forget it's W plus H, not W plus V. So by far, that's the most common mistake. I think to remember is we compute V, there is a negative sign. There's a negative sign in direction. <clears throat> All right, okay. So let's compute V and take a next. So what is the velocity? So if the blade is, so the blade is rotating at 20 RPM. And we know the radius, right? So is 20, 20 meters from the hub. So how do I compute a velocity? How do I compute this linear velocity V? I remember, how do I convert from a rotation speed to a linear speed? Now you need to convert it to radian per second first, right? Right, okay. Okay, so I can first, let's convert this 20 RPM to radians per second, right? So people online, so the suggestion is we need to compute 20 RPM to radians per second. So this is two pi, 20 divided by 60. This is radians per second. Okay. Then what do we do? If you multiply the speed times the radius, that would give you, oh no, that's torque. Uh, that, that's correct, okay, so <laughs> that, that's actually correct. So the way to get a, convert a linear velocity from the rotation velocity is actually the rotational speed in radians per second multiplied by how long it is, okay? That's, that, that's our speed, right? okay. So the way to think about this is often it's useful for kind of units. Okay, so from the rotation speed, we have something like one, divided by second, right, one per second. So linear velocity, I need meters per second. So multiply by the radius of the blade gives you meter per, meters per second. Okay, so it's a very useful check for kind of units. And if you get a units right, you're probably you know, right most of the time. So this is two pi, 20 over 60, times 20. We get 41.89 meters per second. So this is a magnitude. This is the magnitude of the, uh, how fast the linear, this is the magnitude of the linear velocity of the blade. Okay. Now we need to write this in a vector form, right? So we know this, uh, the magnitude is 41.89. What is the angle? So remember, I need to do a vector addition, so I need an angle for this as well. What's the angle? Of H. Look at the figure, what's the angle of H? Good. 270. Right, so, right. so minus 90 or 270? Minus 90 or 270. Sorry, I'm listening to both. I'm listening to the people in class and people online. So I'm gonna to try to repeat the equation, right? So 
this is either minus 90 degrees or if you want this is 270 doesn't matter the equivalent numbers okay so now we can compute wr this is 15 angle 20 degrees plus 41 nine angle minus 90 degrees this comes out to be angle minus 69.02 degrees meters per second okay so this is the relative wind speed for this vectorization right okay any questions about this uh, i've got a quick question yeah go ahead so if you use 270 instead of negative 90 wouldn't that wouldn't work right in this case because the angle is different. Right. So the question that I was repeating is, is you know, does negative 90 and 270 make a difference? No. Right. This angle is, you know, has a period of 2 pi or 360. So we can add 360 to minus 90 to get 270. Right. So, this, so this doesn't matter. So. Oh, okay. I see. Thank you. So yeah. So angles, you have a 360 period you can add. Right. And also, I'm going to assume that we're all comfortable with the uh, vector addition, right? this kind of phasor addition. Right? At least we have seen this in electric circuits. Okay. So I'm assuming you can all do this phasor addition. Any other questions? Yeah, quick question. Yeah, for sorry. H, when you found the angle was negative 90, I know you went off of the picture because it's minus V. Yeah. Is that the only way to figure out H? It's just based off of the picture and knowing that V is, it's the negative V. Right, so that's a good question. The question is, you know, why is H minus 90? Did I just look at the picture? So H is always minus 90, right? Because V is always going horizontally, uh, sort of vertically up and down, right? Because this is a turbine has fixed where it is. And the blade can only spin, uh, you know, we think of the blade going, only going up and down. So the angle of H is always minus 90. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so the angle of H is also minus 90. So this, this angle doesn't change. The minus 90 angle doesn't change. Right? So you just have to, you can remember there's a minus sign. Because most of, you know, very common mistake is to forget this. Either forget there is an angle or forget there is a minus sign on the angle. And so that's a key thing to remember. Otherwise, this kind of question is relatively straightforward. Just a vector addition. Other questions? All right, okay, so let's uh, keep going then. All right, so the thing with angle of attack is, right, so angle of attack is not the best thing to use, that's what we said, because I need to know the reference respect to the true wind speed. I need to know this WR to use alpha angle attack. So most times we don't use this angle of attack. This is very different than say, if you fly an airplane, you hear angle of attack a lot. In power, in wind power, we almost never talk about angle of attack. We almost always use this beta. And this beta is called a pitch angle. And what this beta does is it will reference to the up and down motion of the blade. Okay, so the beta is reference to the using the blade as a frame of reference and measuring how the how much the blade turns reference to the up and down motion to the vertical motion of the wind turbine blade. Okay, so that's the that's sort of the most that's actually the most common angle we use. And again, the reason for using it is I, we, we don't want to figure out what the true wind direction is. That's actually not very easy to do in practice. These things are at, you know, 100 meters high. You really, there's not an easy way to measure wind at that, you know, even the direction of wind uh, with respect to the ground. So we're actually going to basically just use a pitch angle. The idea is I have a blade that's sort of rotating up and down, and I'm going to pitch the angle of the blade. Right? We're going to pitch the angle of the blade. 
We're using that to control, using that to control how much power we get. So we're using that to control how much power we can get. So in some sense, that's a worse measure than the angle of attack. Because the angle of attack, sense is always referring to the uh, true wind speed, to, to, sorry, to the relative wind speed. There is a more of a physical meaning. How much angle do you have against you know, the wind? Pitch angle is just measured to your uh, velocity, go up and down. Okay, so there's sort of less physically meaningful angle, but it's a much easier angle to measure. I can always measure that angle. I can also measure, angle, measure that angle. And it's quite useful in the following way. It's quite useful in the following way. Okay, so how, how does pitch angle work? Right, so, so theta is easier to measure. But the relative speed of wind changes all the time, right? Changes all the time. Okay. The true wind speed, the, the true wind speed and relative wind speed and you know changes all the time, the direction changes all the time. So a constant beta does not mean constant power extraction. So that's a very important thing to remember. So that's that's the difference between alpha and beta. Right? So a constant. Alpha, this leads to sort of relatively constant power extraction. Because you are always referring to the relative wind speed. So if the wind speed changes, you have to change the blade, change alpha accordingly. Okay, so you can keep alpha constant. A constant beta, this does not mean constant power extraction. Because I can keep beta constant. I can keep the angle, you know, constant relatively to the motion of the blade. That does not mean, that does not mean I'm extracting constant power because the actual wind direction and you know, relative wind power could have been something else. Right? I'm keeping beta constant, that doesn't tell me to extract power. So how will you, by how will you, if you can, if you can only measure beta, how will you try to keep the power extract relatively constant? So they're designing the turbine and uh, you, you can't measure wind, right? You, you are, we don't have enough sensors to measure wind. All we can do is measure beta, that, that's that we can do. But how will you keep the power constant? Okay. Uh, no, it's not, you have more blade, it'll be more constant. Okay. Right, so the idea is you think that for the focus taking control class, right, for focus taking control, this is where feedback control comes in. This is a very good example of whatever you, uh, you're learning control, right, for this control class. Why, why is feedback control useful? It's precisely useful for this kind of situation. Okay, so how, how does this actually work in practice? Uh, you, have a, you have a box, this is your turbine. What you do is you measure your power. So this is your power extraction. And then you have a feedback control gate. This is your feedback. And this adjusts your patient. Okay, so you're constantly tracking power. And if you figure out the power is changing, then your goal is to, by tr trying to track how power changes, changing the patient. Try to, let's say, maintain a constant power. Okay, so this is your, this is actually a very common, so if you want to be, this is a sort of the uh, reference power. You take a subtraction, you get an angle, you get an error, and then you feed this error through the feedback controller, try to change your pitch. This we can do. And we can do this without need to measure any of the uh, true wood. Okay, so this block actually in practice is a lot easier to build. 
Then swim third, so that's measures when the 100 meters. Okay, so control actually, you know, taking control class, you're wondering what, where that is used is using all kinds of this kind of situation. Right? Of course, the controller design is not trivial. So this box is typically not linear. The focus on taking linear control, the speed feedback gain is typically not linear. You have to be robust, you have to be adaptive, and do all this thing. But that we can design. So this is cheap. This is, you know, this is software we can design. Whereas a sensor at 100 meters probably cost you $10,000. This thing costs you a few bucks. Okay, so go ahead. Yeah. I guess the, the question I have is um, the students in the data from how much power might not be might not be constant for a single for might not be constant for a single blade to keep the data going, but they're only aware of a few other blades. So are you saying that this is something that would happen during a cycle or is it that would happen on that cycle? Right, okay. So, yeah, so this is a good question. So, the question is well, if I have three blades, do they all have different beta or how do I track this? So, the answer is this power is normally measured as the average power over a few rotations. So, you measure the average power extracting few rotations. Then, all the blades are typically controlled with the same beta. So, you have the same beta on all the blades, you try to track the power. So, there are some averaging going on. But these things rotate fairly fast, so, you know. There are big machines that are totally fairly fast, but we can compute the average power. Any other questions, by the All right, okay. So this is uh, how sort of beta is used, right? So when we look at the equations, how to, you know, having to do with beta, all of those are empirical equations, right? Just, you know, some equation you can show me here to compute things, shoving this sort of block that I don't compute. Right. So this is how controls are done. So if you actually look at wind turbine nowadays, most of software are in the wind turbine is running this kind of control. Machine. There's a lot of software there doing this kind of move. Okay. That's, that's where sort of most, actually today, most of advances go down like this. It's kind of have a better feedback. Okay. And uh, to really do this, you need to take sort of more advanced control classes to get how to control this sort of big nonlinear system. But the idea is very similar to a sort of first control class we take. All right, so next example, we're gonna do a simple example to say that, you know, alpha and beta are very related to each other, right? There's this essentially, this, you know, very similar measurement. It just, uh, one turns out to be more e easier to measure than the other. So for example, continuing from the last example, you have a you know, one true wind speed of 50 meters per second at an angle of 20 degrees with respect to the horizontal plane. And then if my beta, if my pitch angle, this is five degrees, right? What is the angle of attack? So suppose we want to compute the angle of attack, what is the angle of attack, right? Okay, so before we figure out this relatively, this relative one has a angle of, uh, what is this number? 39.37 angle minus 69.02 degrees. Okay, so if you look at this angle then, basically this angle is 69.02 degrees. Okay, this is our angle. And the whole thing adds up to 90 degrees. Right? This whole thing is 90 degrees. So what we have is we have alpha plus theta plus the 69.02. This is 90 degrees. We know beta is five degrees. This so we can compute alpha is 15.98 degrees. Okay, so we can compute from one, you know, they're related by a simple relationship if you know what the uh, relative speed of when it is, right? If you don't know, you can just change beta. Okay, any questions? About the pitch angle and all this? All right, okay, so, okay. So let's uh, keep going then. 
So all of this, as we have been talked about, is how do you extract power from wind, right? There's a sort of, you know, changing the phase angle, you can try to extract more power from wind or keep the power extract constant. So now it's useful to think about you know, how much power can I actually extract from wind, right? You know, at the end of the day, there's finite amount of power in wind. So can you get to 100%, right? If somebody comes to you and tell you, hey, I have a wind turbine, I'm a hundred, you know, I'm 95% efficient. Out of you know, all the power in wind, I can get 95% uh, you know, power out of it. Should you believe that? But is there a turbine design that will ever get you to that point? Okay, so this actually, well, I will do some calculation there. Okay, and the calculation we'll do is a simplified version of the actual calculation going on. But it's a useful thing to, you know, at least think about this kind of power transfer in wind. Okay. So if wind, Right, if some power extracted by the blade, what has to happen? Okay. What has to happen is wind will have some speed, will come to the blade. Your air will still flow after the blade. Right? The conservation of mass. So whatever air gets into the blade has to go out of the blade. It has to get out of the area anyways. Okay. So there is a upwind and a downwind. Right? There's upwind coming to the, to the turbine and after turbine, you know, extracts one power, there's some uh, power, go, there's still some, you know, power left in the air, okay? So we extract power, right? So we, so the turbine extracts power if air moves slower after it moves through the turbine. All right, so we have a faster moving air mass, you have a slower moving air mass, and the difference has to go here. This is sort of where it goes. So this is how it tracks speed. So the idea is so you know you have some kinetic energy. Kinetic energy of the blade is really just the assuming there's no losses. It's just a kinetic energy of the upwind minus kinetic energy downwind. And uh, we're going to assume that M is constant. So we assume okay. So we're not going to lose air, right? So let's say a conserve the mass the amount of air is a conserved quantity. So this, there has to be a speed difference. Okay? There has to be a speed difference up one and down one. Okay. So let's compute the mass flow rate. And our goal is trying to get a sort of formula based on the upwind speed and downwind speed to see how much power we're actually getting out of. Okay, so one way to evaluate the amount of power or what, you know, how efficient a wind turbine is, is just to compute this, you can measure the speed in front of it, speed after it, and then compute for how much power being extracted. Right? Are you getting most power or not? So mass flow, right? So for all those equations we use, there is a M here, right? There is an M mass here. So we need also to deal with this mass. We need to see how much air is flowing through the blade, um, through the turbine. Okay, so, well, if you look at mass flow rate, uh, this is amount of stuff moving through air per unit of time. Uh, this is for kilogram per second. How much stuff I'm moving through it. Mass is, as we've seen before, right, this area, cross-sectional area, multiplied by the speed, multiplied by time, multiplied by density, that's mass. You divide time out of it. This is A times speed times the density, and this, this is a constant. Okay, so our assumption is the mass flow rate through the thing is a constant. We're not gonna lose, we're not gonna lose too much air, mass, mass of air through it. Okay. So if I have a constant flow rate of mass, then what happens is, So we'll have a constant flow rate. Okay. 
Then what has to happen? Well, I have some upwind flow. There are some at the turbine, there are some uh, flow rate. There are some turbine, there are some flow rate. And then downwind, there are some flow. Okay. So this kind of equation we're trying to relate. We're trying to do is we're trying to sort of find equations to get power, get power out. We're trying to do is, right? So we can compute the power in the upstream air, we'll compute the power in the downstream air. Now we're trying to get power. We're trying to get power into how much power can I extract out of the turbine. That's our goal. So we're trying to move to that power equation okay. at the turbine. Any questions so far? Okay. So we'll eventually get to an equation. So things appear a little bit, uh, you know, you don't know where it's going, we'll eventually get an equation. It relates to the power you can extract to the uh, difference in C. Okay. All right, so what has to happen? Well, this, right, so since the flow rate is constant and the speed are different, then the areas has to be different, right? You have less, you, the area, you can think of this as we mass, air mass moves through the blade, this expands, air mass boundary expands. Okay, there's some expansion air mass boundary because there is the same amount of stuff moving through. Some are faster, some are slower, then the area moves through has to expand because there's constant flow rate. Uh, Okay, so this is the, okay. So they're all equal, the speed are different. This has to be the same, right? And what this does is basically this fills up this kind of uh, envelope. This fills up this kind of envelope in the, when wind moves through a turbine. And what this actually gives you idea is why you cannot place wind turbines very close to each other. It's not okay if you that. You cannot place two wind turbines right next to each other. And the reason is this air mass expands. So the speed gets slower, the air mass envelope expands. So you don't have enough power here. Once the expansion is very large. So you have to place the next blade far enough away for this envelope to come back. Okay, so you cannot place things very close to each other. But otherwise, one blade will impact the operation of the blade next to it. Okay. All right, so, the, so we have this kind of envelope. Again, when you think about air moving through the blade, you cannot just think of a constant tube of air that's moving. There's an expansion, and there's a, the envelope is quite complicated how the thing moves. So we'll make an assumption and the key assumption we'll make is we need to know how the speed changes. What is the speed as the turbine? So, the, so this is a actually quite challenging part in practice to compute. Is I can, I can measure the, you know, the upwind speed. I can measure the downwind speed. But how do I know what is the speed, what the speed is as the blade itself? But how do I know the actual speed of wind coming to the blade? Let's say you have upwind speed of 10 meters per second, downwind speed of five meters per second. What is the speed at the blade, right? My power extracted depends on the speed at the, at the point of the blade. That is actually also hard to measure when you have a big blade spinning around. That, that, that's not an easy number to measure as well. Okay. Let me think of a good approximation we can use. So when you don't know this, so when you don't know what happens in the middle, what's a good approximation you can always do? Is it like the average? Right, they use the average, right? Take, take the average. We don't know what the right speed is, take the average. So we're gonna assume this is the number, okay? You can do a lot of calculus to figure out what the true number is. It's not gonna be very different from this number. So this is not a bad assumption. Too. It's not a bad assumption. There's ways you can compute what the truth speed is, but this is not a terribly bad uh, calculation. Okay. So now we can compute the power. With all this, we're gonna compute the power. Okay. So the power as a blade 
upwind minus power downwind. Right, this is our power. So the power compute captured by the blade. This is the changes in connected energy. Right, so this is write as a connected energy upwind minus the connected energy downwind divided by t. This is half m divided by t squared minus half m divided by t squared. Right, so this is just the difference. This is just the difference in the uh, connected energy between the two. So we can combine these two equations. This is half the flow rate as a blade multiplied by this difference. Okay, I have a flow rate as a blade. So I know the speed down when the, the speed up when speed down when. So if I know how much stuff is going through the blade, then I, I know the power as a blade. Okay, so I need to compute how much stuff is going through it. Well, the flow rate as a blade, this is mass divided by time. This is delta, the area of the blade multiplied by the speed of the wind as the blade. And then we're going to use the assumption we made on the last page to compute this W, the speed of wind. It's delta, area of the blade, multiplied by the average of the speed. Okay, so th this is our flow rate. Then you combine everything together. Now we're gonna combine everything together to get the equation for the amount of power you can extract. Okay, so the power is actually, yeah. So uh, well, this long equation, I wanna finish that. So actually let's take our break now. When we come back, we'll put these two together and find the long equation that relates the power extractor to the upwind speed, downwind speed. All right. Okay, so let's, what time is it? Oh, that clock is, okay. All right, so 9.25, let's take a 10 minute break. We'll come back at 9.35, let's put the equations together. Okay, let's get started again. All right, so yeah, so again for the folks on Zoom, uh, it's hard for me to monitor the chat, so if you can just call out if you you know even if you type something on the chat, so I can have a look at. Uh, so we're looking at many screens at the same time here, all right? So, right. So we got to basically the equation, right, of the power of the blade of the power of the blade power you can extract from the blade, right? Depends on two depends basically on the upwind and downwind speed, right? So it's a little bit complicated. You have to modify. A, you have to bit, multiply these two equations together. You to modify them together to figure out what the power is. So that, we'll do that, and then we'll do a bunch of manipulations. Okay, and the goal we're going to try to write, we're going to try to write the following equation, which is our goal. Right? So you can modify the two together. But the formula by itself is not typically, you know, it's not extremely interesting. The more interesting thing is we're going to try to do it and we we'll try to do to so write it in this way. We know how much power is delivered by the upwind speed. Okay, so our goal is to write into a formula like this. All right, so this is the powering width. Okay, this is the uh, total amount of power in wind. You look at the upwind speed, right, multiplied by the area, multiplied by the density, and cube the speed. This is the total power you have. We're not going to extract this power, but we're going to multiply this two and get something out of it. So the idea is to write this as this, no, this number, this is 100% of power multiplied by some number. And we're more interested in the CP number that will eventually compute. Because this tells us how good your turbine is, right? You know, CP, hopefully, if our equations make sense, CP will be a number between zero and one and tell us a fraction of power we can extract. Right? So that's our hope. Right? So before even doing this on computation, 
That's a good half a sanity tracking mod. For example, if we do a calculation, CP is bigger than one, then we know that there's something wrong. Right? So that's sanity track we'll have. So hopefully, some number between zero and one tells us the fraction of power you can get, fraction of one power you can get. And most times in practice, you care about CP, not so much. This is again given by nature, not much you can do. But this number, CP is what you guys control. Okay, so we want to compute CP, but uh, so before that, let's just uh, you know multiply these two together and see what happens. Right? So P blade is half F. Then the flow rate is delta area of the blade with the assumption that this is the average. So speed of the blade is the average of the two speeds. So P blade, multiply everything together. This is half delta area of the blade. Most of this just you know, things multiple together. So if you just look at this equation, it's not it's, it's a equation. It's a equation. Uh, so it's good to have a going month because if you just look at this equation, you don't quite know what to do with. There's a lot of numbers in there. What, what do I do with this equation? So our goal is to again to write it into this form. Okay, our goal is to write that equation into this equation. So how do we do that? How do we do that? And thing to do it is you basically pattern match. Okay, what equation do you want? Right? We want half delta AB. So these things are good. We have all these uh, terms already. I want this, right? I want this to come out. This again is the total, you know, the amount of power in the way. Multiply by, Whatever. <laughs> this is our goal. Our goal is to extract, pull out a WU cube, somehow get this thing out of it. Look at whatever is left in the bracket and uh, just you know, get expression for the bracket. Okay. Right, so our goal is to find this. That's good. Again, so before you do any derivations, you know how this kind of equations. You should know what you want. You should know what you want, right? If you know what you want, all those equations are much easier to do. Okay, so I want this. Let's see what happens. Okay, so let's see what is left over if I do this. Okay, so let's look. A delta, a B, W cubed. Okay, so what is left over in this? Well, I have a one half, one plus, Where does this come from, right? This comes from pulling a WU out of the first equation. Okay. So I pull a WU out of the first equation, I got this first term. I'm gonna pull a WU squared out of the second equation, one minus, okay. Right. This is my second, this is, right? So what happens is, oh sorry, I got a square. So the first term comes from pulling a W out of first, pulling one W out, the second term comes from pulling this W square out of this thing. So get a W cubed from it. Okay. Any questions with this step? Okay, so this is just again pattern matching. We know that's the equation we want. We're gonna do this. So now if you look at what, whatever is left over, whatever is left over, you have this fraction showing up twice, right? This sort of WD over W, this fraction shows up twice. So we're gonna, instead of writing this fraction over and over again, we're gonna think of, you know, use a shorthand called gamma to denote this fraction. So just, I don't have to write it again and again, okay? So gamma is a number, Right, as number. And from this division, since there's a downwind speed divided by the upwind speed, there's a number between zero and one. Right? So the one is slower after going through a turbine. 
So this is if this is something between zero and one. D W cube half of one plus gamma one minus gamma square. Okay. So if I just do a straight straightforward substitution, right? Okay, and this is our coefficient of performance. Right, so we can think of this as coefficient of performance. This is the power in wind. So the first term is how much power I have in this wind intrinsically. The second term is what I can hope to extract out of it. Right? What I can hope to extract out of it. Any questions about these steps? Okay, efficiency measure. measure exactly yeah so the coefficient of performance which is the efficiency measure so this is cp yeah so this coefficient of performance is cp it's our efficiency measure any other questions okay okay so remember our sanity check right we want cp to be a number between zero and one so the only makes sense of this if this is efficient measure has to be between zero and one. Otherwise, we have some problems. So this is an easy thing to check if it's between zero and one. You know, you can prove it. You can just graph this. So gamma, you take a gamma and graph it. Right? So gamma has to be between zero and one. It's a function of gamma. You can graph it. And if you graph this, it's actually something interesting happens. Something interesting happens. It doesn't peak necessarily at where you think will peak. Okay, so if you just look at this equation, you may think the maximum should happen when gamma is zero. Okay, you may think, oh, I should extract the maximum power when the downwind speed is zero. Okay, maybe that's where I should extract maximum power. That's where, you know, the I'm looking at the difference in power, right? That's you know, the power has to go to the blink. That actually doesn't happen. So if you plot this function. You plot this function. This function, so when gamma is zero, this function is one half. When gamma is one, this function is zero, so that makes sense. But it goes something like this. There is some maximum gamma is there. It reaches some value. I forgot exactly the value, but it reaches some exact value. All right, so this gamma is never, so you cannot get to 100% efficiency. And the best way to, and the best, the most efficient way you can do it is actually not to build a wall and stop all the work. So you actually don't want the downstream speed to be zero. You want there still to be some downstream speed for this to work, okay? And this is actually, a, you can prove a theorem based on this. This is actually called a best ratio. So we won't do this in class, but you see that in your homework. There is a maximum CP you can ever build for any one. So for any turbine you can possibly construct, there's a maximum limit to the efficiency given by CP, given by this function. So you can differentiate this and, you know, and that will give you a, a maximum efficiency. So the interesting question is, why is it that having the down, downwind CP in zero is not the most efficient? Uh, intuitively, if you look at this, you know, without doing the calculation, you would think, yeah, you know, to extract the most power, let's just stop the wind. Right? Yeah, this is easy. But why is that not good? Okay, why is the most efficiency not? The efficiency thing not just, uh, go ahead. Yeah. Right, so yeah, so the answer in class is that, well, it's not just the speed, it's also about the area, right? The mass going through. And that's the right, that's the right trade off to think of. As your speed reduces, the envelope gets larger and larger. The envelope expands. So your mass flow rate also reduces. So it's a trade off effect between how much speed you can extract out of it versus just the envelope expanding and you're not getting enough mass. You're just not getting enough air. So that trade off, turns out to peak somewhere in the middle. 
I guess it will peak, start peak somewhere in the middle. And uh, yeah, somebody wants to take a quick derivative and figure out what the peak is. I think it's two thirds or something. There's a number there, but the, uh, there is a trade off there. Okay. And this, so the thing to remember is it's not just about speed, it's also about the amount of mass you can push through the area. Both matters, both matters in this equation. Okay. So this was something that's uh, not, uh, not that intuitive going on. Any other questions? Okay, so having this efficiency measure is important. It's actually a very important measure because even today you see people claiming they can feel you 90% efficient turbines, which is not possible. Right? You can maximize this to some number that's not 90%. Right? So it's good to have this sort of fundamental limit in mind and knowing how much more you can squeeze out your turbine below. And today we're pretty good. Like our CP has been creeping up. Before in the 70s and 80s, we're about 10%, you know, far from the circle limit. Now this we're about 40%, which is not so bad, 30, 40%. So we're getting, this will gain quite a bit. And so it's unlikely we'll make you know, a doubling of CP if we can extract or something. It's unlikely we'll make huge gains in that area. We're getting more and more efficient. Right? Okay, so this is our power extracted by the blade. All right, so you can think of the, so there's some various ways you can define this. You can define this with, with that T blade. This is again, just writing this equation again, delta AB cubed. Gamma, one minus gamma squared. That's the equation. When it define this as Pw, this is a one power, or the power in one. Right? So think of this is the amount of power in one. And then the coefficient performance is the amount of power you can extract divided by the total amount of power, interesting power you have in one. And then you can also think about this as, so if you compare this P1 versus P upstream, there's a slight difference between these two equations. This is, okay. So this is the slight difference between the two. So this is the difference in, So this is the difference in the area. So if you write down these two, okay, so the up one power, the area you compute is AU, the amount of uh, power you have up one. The one power at the blade is taking the blade area multiplied by the up one speed. Okay, that's where the slight difference here. So often you'll see this if you want as uh, blade, Divide by the up one power, normalized by the differencing area. Okay. This also happens. You see also you also see this equation. Okay. So just uh, keep in mind, there's various things people talk about. There's the power extracted by the blade. There's the one power as a blade. There's one power, and there's the up one power. Just uh, different terminologies. Questions for this? Okay, so just a lot of equations, right? So let's do an example uh, with all these equations and see how they're used. So there's just the equations typed out again, right? So let's say I have a wind turbine with a mass flow rate of 20,000 kilograms per second. I measure the upwind speed is 20 meters per second. I measure the downwind speed is 18.7 meters per second. Right, let's compute a bunch of things. Okay, the how large are the air masses? How large are the areas up and downwind? What is wind power in up and downwind? And then what is the power captured by the blades? What is coefficient performance? Compute the various different ways. Okay, so let's do this uh, example. So let's first compute the 
side of the areas up and downwind. So this is not uh, very hard to do. So again, we're going to assume the density is one kilogram per meter cube. It's almost always we'll make this assumption for density. Right? So with in this in this class we'll always make this assumption. And then we have the area upstream. So the flow rate is a constant. Okay? This is a constant. Divide by the speed, divide by the density. Right? So the flow rate is dividing how large area you're flowing through, divided by the density. So this is 20,000 divided by 20. So the area, you can think of the wind is flowing through a circular area with a uh, with an area of a, a thousand meter square. So if we want, we can convert this to a, right, so this is some circle, the shaded area is a thousand meter square. We can compute the diagonal of the, oh, sorry, the diameter of the circle, this is, U. This is 35.7 meters. Okay, so think of this as a circle that's 35.7 meters large. Uh, the diameter is 35.7. Okay. So this is upstream. Upwind. The downwind is uh, similar calculation. We're moving slightly slower. So this is it's a slightly larger circle now. Pi, this is 37. Okay. So the idea is even though you have the area expanding and contracting, they're not doing it by a lot. So the numbers are typically turns out to be quite similar. And this is sort of the typical numbers you'll see. Just how big the envelopes are. Questions with this? All right, so this is how big the envelopes are. And now, now let's just compute the, uh, now let's just compute the power, right? So the power we have in F1, this is half, Density times area times speed cube one half thousand twenty cube four megawatt. Okay, so this is our area calculation. This is power calculation. Similarly for downwind. So this is the amount of power we have up when the amount of power we have down. So the key thing to remember for this calculation is again the area. Okay, so make sure you compute the area correctly. Because often you tend people tend to assume the areas are all just constant, and then so speed is only different. That's actually not quite right. Okay, remember the area mass is moving extends a little bit. It extends a little bit. So the, again, the most common mistake you see on exams, for example, uh, so people forget this is different. The areas are different. Okay, so the first part of the question doesn't matter is compute the area. Okay, any questions about this? Okay, all right. Then the power of the blade is simple, right? So we know there's a power up one, the power down one, then the power of the blade simply you divide these two, right? divide these two. So there's a, sorry, you subtract the two, four minus 3.5, 0.5 megawatts. So this is how much, how, how much power we're extracting. Now we can compute the coefficient of performance. Right? We can compute, or, you know, how well we're doing compared to the theoretical maxima. There's different ways to compute it. For example, let's use the, this equation. 
as a tower we can extract from the blade. Divide by the up, up one tower, normalized by the area. Okay, normalized by the area. Okay, so you need to normalize by the area because even as in theory, the maximum you can extract, you're limited by the area of the blade. Okay, how big your turbine. So it's important to normalize this area out of it. So we can compute this AB. This is flow rate divided by the speed of wind at the blade. As we saw, this is the average of the two up and up, up and then downwind speed. So this turns out to be 20,000. Five, this is six squared. Okay. So this is how big the area is. You plug all this in 0. 0.5 divided by four. Yeah, so get a coefficient performance about 0.12, the 12%. Okay, extracting 12 for some time. Any questions with this calculation? Okay, so this is one way to compute it. There is sort of another way to compute it, right? So we can compute it as uh, So these better be consistent. I better get the same coefficient of performance out of it. 7 to 20, this is 0.35. Plug that in, you get again point, the same number as before. Okay, so you get a consistent solution. Right? Any questions with this point of calculation? All right, okay, so this is a so this is a typical sequence of questions you'll see in homework in, in, uh, in the midterm, for example, right? And uh, you know you can normally you ask to compute a coefficient performance. You can compute it whichever way you want. Uh, this is a standard check you want to do it just to make sure it's consistent, but you can compute whichever way you want. And the key is just to remember where the equation. How do you find the equations? And remember where the equations are, remember what each term is. Okay, so it's, you won't be asked to derive any of the equations, but uh, just remember where they are. Remember. Where okay, any questions? All right, so CP number. Okay, so again, one thing really you want to check is your CP is something reasonable. Right, you get something bigger than one or negative, that's definitely wrong. But still you get something like, you know, 0.95, that's also probably wrong, so that, that's just a good chance. Okay, so a lot of times a question that's structured that way, if you make a mistake, for example, if you get the one half, will be bigger than one. Okay, so that's a hint, right? So check your equation, whether it's done correctly or not. Okay, so we, we tend to do this in the questions. Right, so if you make a mistake, you know, if you say you get a negative CP, uh, you know, we'll deduct, uh, we'll be pretty harsh on a grading. <laughs> Something will tolerate, but sometimes when the answer is obviously not possible, it right, will we'll be fairly harsh on grading. Okay. All right, so other very things in when we can define, because a lot of times, Measuring this sort of upwind and downwind speed is not uh, the easiest thing to do, especially the downwind speed. So you don't want to do that. So often what people do is people come up with sort of different metrics and you can rewrite the equation. And people will come with different sort of different ways you can rewrite the equation. And for example, this CP formula, depending on the ratio, this gamma, depending on the ratio between the up and downwind speed. Well, there's different ratio of wind speed that you can define. For example, there's something called a tip speed ratio. And the way to think about this is, I can compute how fast the linear speed of how fast my turbine is turning. I can compute how fast it's turning. This is the speed. 
Like I look at the ratio of how fast this is turning, divide out the speed of the wood, the, up, the upward speed coming at me. Okay, from this ratio, this is also a way to write the equations. This is another way to write equations will give you a quadrature performance. And this is again slightly easier to measure because we can measure the tip, right? We can measure the V tip. We can measure how fast our own uh, turbine is going. And this is something we can do. Whereas some other speed measurements may be diff more difficult to measure. Okay, so this just again changing the uh, changing the equations by looking at different uh, measures, different measures. Okay, so this is some lambda. You'll see this quite a bit. This is called the tip speed ratio. This is just saying I can measure. I can measure this. They're just saying I can measure this. Speed. Okay. I can measure this two speeds are relatively easier to measure. Okay. And so if you look at this equation, this involves this up one speed, WU. The thing is this, for this, we only need the speed. I don't need the direction. But before we said angle or attack was hard to work with because it's measure the you know, relative, one, uh, well, relative one speed. In that case, you need both direction and speed. Direction is hard to measure. Speed is relatively easy to measure. Okay, so I can measure speed without measuring direction. This is just a ratio of the absolute speed. So that I can define this number. I can define this number and then rewrite the equation in this number. I want to rewrite the equation in this number. So the way to do it is we have coefficient performance half, one plus gamma squared. So we want to write lambda in terms of gamma. This is sort of what, uh, what we want to do. So this whole thing becomes, we know gamma equals to WD or WU. So we know that W equals WU plus WD divided by two. So I can eliminate the downwind speed out of this equation, out of this gamma expression. It's two W over W, WU minus one. Okay, so nothing mysterious going on. It's just, I don't want to deal with this WD number. Okay, so I'm yeah, we're too lazy to deal with this number. We're gonna eliminate that from the equation. We're gonna write, going to take that out from the equation. Okay. Then lambda is the tip of the speed divided by WU. This is what we have. So gamma is now two lambda. Just direct substitution. Okay, not much going on. Directly substitute one equation into the other. Okay, so we can measure lambda, then we can write gamma in terms of lambda. And then our CP equation becomes okay, that's again direct substitution. Uh, substituting one equation into the other, you get a new equation that comes up. And again, you use whether one of the other equations depending on what measurement you can take. And so you could take, you know, downwind speed. You can use the first equation. CP is something depending on gamma. If it's easier for you to measure the lambda number, the lambda ratio, use the best. Okay, just, just there's nothing new going on. It's just a plot. Okay, so just a plot. It's just, just a, another way to rewrite the equation. Okay, any questions for this? So for you guys, uh, just knowing that there's two equations. Yeah, that's Right, so the good question is, uh, can you measure W? Is there a way to measure W? There are ways to measure W, and that typically comes from an averaging of measure at the hub. 
So take a few measurements and try to average them out. Best way to measure W. And most often, we actually won't even measure W. So the most often, the way is remember the feedback control, call that you, just do that. Have it, have your target you want to hit and try to track that. That'll be easy. So this is a way to compute your performance. But in actual operations, we don't measure W. Or we don't measure any of this thing. Okay. But it's just another way to write down the coaching performance. Because this tells you a different way to optimize it. Right, so what you can think of, so actually that's a good question. So let's continue on that point. Right? So you look at this, if you look at the first, the CP equation on top, if you look at this equation, it seems to you that there's not much you can do to optimize this equation, right? You know, off ones definitely is something that's, again, you have no control of. The downwind speed you have control of, but it's not clear how exactly you get control of that. Where if you write it this way, the velocity of the tip, this V tip, this actually has some control. How fast is my turbine turn? That I can actually control. So this tells you if I want to improve the current performance, look at this number. This will indirectly impact your downspeed wind. It will indirectly impact your wind at your turbine. But at least give you engineering a way to do better. You know, Right. If I'm changing my CP, I have this turbine, what do I do? I can change how fast this thing is rotating compared to how fast the wind is blowing. So that's sort of more engineering uh, intuition. Rather than the top equation, CP, the gamma equation, that's more of a, sure, that's, you can compute it. It doesn't tell you how to optimize it. The second equation is as, at least there's something I can control in that equation. Right. There are more explicit control variables in that equation. Yeah, so that's a good question. That's uh, one way to think about it. This V-tip, I can directly impact that, that appears in the equation explicitly. Right. So that's another way to think about it. Any other questions? Okay, so this is our, another way to compute the quotient performance. We can plot it again, you know, this, the two equations are again exactly equivalent. They're the same equation, writing down by different variables. So they're equal to each other. They're, they're exactly equal to each other. And again, if you change the tip speed ratio, there is some maximum CP. And this is more an engineering constraint. We can, some control of V tip. Okay. We have some control of this number. We can control how fast it turns. And that is more, that's for, you can think of how do you optimize the CP. And by changing this tip, by changing the speed, rotational speed, we can sort of try to hit the, for example, the maximum CP in the middle. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, is this go by like uh, changing the mechanics inside like internally? Right, so the yeah. question is how do you change this? This is changed by uh, the pitch angle. You change the pitch angle to change how fast you turn, actually. So the main control variable is again the pitch angle. So at the end of the day, the most things we change in real time is this beta angle, the pitch angle. Everything else is uh, hard, but the pitch angle, we change it all the time. So you can think of the changing of the pitch angle, changes the rotational speed of the turbine, in turn changes the coefficient of performance, you can think of you want to track the maximum coefficient performance if you want by changing the pitch angle. There's many the pitch angle eventually relates to your performance in a very nonlinear way. In a very nonlinear way, but that's the main control variable we have. Any other questions? That's a good question. Okay, go ahead. Right, so the question is, if I don't know the, uh, how do I determine AU? AU really doesn't show up in this equation, right? The areas are all divided out in this equation. So really this lambda, this is a ratio of the speed, not the area. The area doesn't enter this equation. I just have to measure the speed. The area really is a secondary effect of the conservation of mass because the speed changes. 
we can think of there's an envelope of air moving through. Right? There's no physical boundary that you can see. Right? Just from, you know, conceptually, because the air is, we want conservation. We can think of the area envelope changing. Good, any other questions, good questions? Okay, so this is the graph you can draw, right? So normally we want to operate, you know, in a good range, right? You don't want to be inefficient. So you try to track somewhere in the middle. You try to change your pitch angle, that change your rotational speed, and then you tra you tra uh, you track in the middle. All right, so the idea of tracking this comes down to this is called a region of operations for wind turbine. So again, wind turbine is not that the larger the wind, the more power you generate. The wind turbine mostly operate with this kind of curve. So the wind speed, as wind speed increases, you do output more power. That's for sure, right? So as speed, you output more power. So, but there is a cutting speed. So if the speed is too small, I cannot generate meaningful power. It's, it's pretty, if speed is close to zero, there's, there's inertia, right? there's inertia in the turbine, you can't actually go. Okay? So small speed doesn't make sense. Then you ramp it after you get to a, as the speed increases, we do this ramp. And then there's a rated power limit. Okay? There's a rated power limit. So, some at a point you hit your maximum power, you can deliver. This power, for example, is limited by your generator. Yeah, your generator may have a limited power. Right? Generator, this the, the most power your generator could generate. So you hit the rate of power, then when the speed is very high, you cut it off. Okay? When the speed is very high, you cut it off. So to maintain this, to track this. change by changing the patient. Right? Our goal is to track. So how do you make sure your output power is constant when the wind speed is changing? You change your pitch angle to change your coefficient of performance. Right? The power you generate is the total power you have, is the total power in wind multiplied by this efficiency. So the total power in wind is changing, you change your efficiency measure to track a constant power. And this is done, you know, most turbines have fairly sophisticated way to track this. There's sort of feedback loops, there's a lot of feedback loops that ensures that you can offer in this rated power. So another way to think about it is anything in this area. So anything in this area is possible. For example, you can always derate your wind turbine a little bit to offer it smaller than your possibly max rated power. Okay, so the way to think about it is anything above this blue curve is not possible. Okay, we cannot offer in that range. Anything underneath the blue curve is possible. We can offer in that range. Okay. And the, so when you have to derate the power, so it's, it's actually, it's, Nowadays, there's a lot of situations where you offer less than your maximum power. You're being asked to offer a little bit less than your maximum power. Can you guys think of some situation where you have to offer it below the maximum curve? Yeah, go ahead. Right, so when would you want to limit that? Like what situation? Right. Right, so one is you have enough demand, right? The demand, maybe some, there's a lot of wind, so every wind power, has, every turbine has to stretch, stretch a little bit. Can you think of another situation where you have to do that? Okay. Okay, that's one, but can you think of some, there's actually another sort of big reason why you sometimes get offer it a less power. So the other reason you have is sometimes you may have a short circuit fault between your turbine and the grid. And that happens a lot more than you would think. For example, you have a lighting strike that strikes a light, that strike may be clear you know, in half a second 
or a fraction of a second. But within that time, you don't have a connection to the rest of the grid. So you have to power, you have to dump power. And that's often where you have to offer at a much lower rate of power. Right. So that's another, so one is uh, you don't have enough demand. That's for more of a sustained re reduction. Another is you have a fault and it has to reduce by quite a lot. So there's different mechanisms to do that. Okay, yeah. Right, so the good question is if storage is included, <laughs> what happens? So that's the open question we don't know. There's a debate of whether you should engineer the turbine just to be able to be very flexible. That costs money, right? It costs money. Or you can spend the money to buy a battery storage and then just use the storage to account for all those uncertainties. We're not quite sure which is more economically viable. Yeah, so that's a good question that even now, like PSD is trying to figure this out. As, as a, you know, should I spend money on a fancy turbine that's mechanically very flexible, or should I spend money buying a big bag? That's something to think about yeah, in practice. We're not quite sure which is more. Okay, all right, so with that, I'll end the uh, class here today. Remember homework one is out. See you Friday night, at mid, uh, Friday at midnight. Okay, so then I'll see you uh, Thursday. Thank you, Professor.